Hi, I'm Anne Janderson. I'm consultant for therapeutic and technological interventions in education, and I'm also a writer. I'm a special needs advisor for a global VR company as well. It's very nice to be here at this World Education Summit in 2022. And today I'm going to look at, talk about how virtual reality can change the way that we facilitate learning for those with learning differences who are also known as neurodivergent. As you may be aware, we're living now during the fourth industrial revolution, which is full of exciting possibilities for schools. Since the first industrial revolution, schools have served the economy, which is the outside world. But we are born into two worlds, the outside world and the inner world. The outside world can carry on without us, and it's important that we learn how to get by in the outside world. Our own private world could be full of anxieties, hopes and desires that may not be met by traditional education that's designed to meet the needs of the economy and the outside world. The traditional way of learning is often based on memorizing certain facts and formulas and regurgitating them for exams. In this technological age, we can access more information from the internet in an instant than we could ever memorize in a lifetime. If we don't educate our inner world to cope in the outer world, then it doesn't matter what opportunities the outer world holds for us. We may not be able to access those opportunities. In my many years as head teacher of special school, a major concern for myself and the staff were the communication difficulties and mental health challenges that students suffered as a result of their conditions and also because of the neurotypical world outside of themselves that they have to contend with. It's not just students in a special school that suffer with communicating their anxieties. One only has to look at the number of students who don't complete their education and drop out of the education system. If we don't teach students how to manage their inner world, then the mental issues, mental health issues that this causes can have a devastating effect on their quality of life and their future. The Prison Reform Trust shows that 60% of prisoners have problems with communication, either understanding, <coughs> excuse me, or expressing themselves, or both. If we don't support the mental health challenges and the mental health development of our students, we bring upon ourselves their future. And we will spend an enormous amount of money dealing with the damage. We cannot begin to learn until we're in the right frame of mind to learn, regardless of our learning differences. So how do we address it? I'm not suggesting that we try and change people who are neurodivergent into people who are neurotypical. That in itself could be classed as ableism, one of the many isms like racism and sexism and all those others that are, that are prejudgments that some people use to exude control over others. I'm not suggesting that. What I am suggesting is that we use technology to help neurodivergence gain control in a neurotypical world. Students with my um, students with learning differences in my experience, for instance, have shown high levels of comfort with technology for many reasons. Computer programs are predictable, logical, and can provide intellectual outlet for those with specialized interests. All of my students in my last school had their own individualized iPads updated regularly to meet the data we had on them so that their learning was personalized. Another piece of technology that we found could actually change the lives of some of our students was the eye gaze, technology that uses the eyes to communicate. 
neurofeedback, vibroacoustic therapy, and so on, are technologies that we used that made a positive difference to some of our students. I write about these in my books. We found that our students born into this fourth industrial revolution were comfortable with technology. What they did find uncomfortable though, were real life situations. How often as a parent or teacher stood by helplessly as the child has a meltdown in the supermarkets, crossing the road, taking a train journey. Parents and teachers have watched them play back a scene over and over again to help them make sense of a confusing neurotypical world. Many teachers and parents will recall times when a neurodivergent child would not forget a particular incident. with a peer that bothered them. And they seem determined to wreck the day for themselves by repeatedly trying to sort it out in their own head to their satisfaction. These incidences are extremely distressing for the onlookers, but even more mentally distressing for the person who needs to rewind. The child may actually be attempting to build new neural pathways, which require practice and more practice. It's much like when we're using, uh, learning a new skill, say playing a new sport or riding a bike. We can't do it efficiently the first time as a rule, but with practice, we can become better at it. And that's what building neural pathways in the brain are all about. I wanted to find out how we could use technology to make life easier for parents and staff, but more importantly for the students. How could we use the technology that they seem to enjoy to make real life situations easier for themselves? What if we were to use the information we had to recreate these situations using what we already had, which was a multi-sensory room? Many special schools have these interactive multi-sensory rooms that allow students to touch a wall or a floor to learn colours, learn about animals, etc. But for me, I wanted to get more bang for my buck, as it were, because I personally felt the classroom interactive whiteboards could deliver those sessions on colour and so on. I wanted a room that children with learning differences could enter, press a switch, and the room becomes an interactive version of a place that has been giving them concerns. And that sometimes sends them into meltdowns. As I said, the local crossing, supermarket, train station, etc. But safe and secure with a trusted, experienced teaching assistant, the student could play back that scene as much as they needed to until they felt comfortable enough to visit its real life counterpart as well as it fulfilling part of the health and well-being curriculum, aiding students' mental health, it also fulfills that part of the digital curriculum where students are learning digital skills and applying them to the real world to affect real life situations. In 2015, I researched what Haifa University had done. University professors Naomi Jossman and Tama Wise had used their VR room in Israel um, for a month long program with students who had autism and were seven to 12 year old, and they needed to learn to cross the local road safely. They found that using their VR room to teach children how to cross the local road dramatically improved their ability to do so. VR gives us the concept of presence the feeling of being somewhere, our brain's way of telling us an experience is real. VR activates the motor cortex in our sensory system in a way that's similar to real life experiences. We found that majority of our students could not tolerate wearing a VR headset, either from sensory or physical impairments or sensory processing issues. 
and that restricted them from doing so. So although we did use them with some students, in some instances, we used the multi-sensory room for delivering the experiences I'm going to tell you about now. Handheld controls and haptics can deliver, can determine the level of vibration used so that students who are blind can actually experience VR. Because VR doesn't stand for visual reality, but virtual reality. And so it's possible to create a virtual reality of what some students have to encounter on a daily basis, perhaps if required, using auditory input and haptic input more. In the autumn term of 2015, I sent a questionnaire out to parents and students asking them which experience the children found most stressful. At the same time, the, same time, the Parents Association began fundraising for the equipment needed for the VR room. In the spring of 2016, I asked the innovative um, technology firm OMI, OMI to install the 360 degree multi-sensory room installation, but I wanted it differently to what they usually did because we didn't need the, the literacy and maths backgrounds that they were installing. What we did want, we did want their relaxing beach themes and similar scenes like that that all students could benefit from and meditate on. But we also wanted background scenes that the parents had requested. Omni agreed to try and in the summer recess, they installed the multi-sensory additions and some, um, some 3D interactive background scenes. So all the technology and the 3D background scenes the, those 3D background scenes <laughs> happened to be a German shopping mall and a European underground. Um, so we felt we needed the scenes to be more personalised for our locality and our students. And so we actually trained our staff on the production of our own 360 scenes. I studied re and, and um, researched on the use of VR and I produced risk assessments, policies, the protocol for using the room, consent forms, recording forms, and all the necessary documentation to ensure that we were covered as a school to deliver what could be regarded as exposure therapy. But we named it VR therapy. The staff and parents voted for learning to cross the local road as the first VR experience. Our students had experienced difficulties when they were expected to wait at the local pedestrian crossing, which had a waiting time of three minutes. Three minutes is quite a long time for students who are already anxious. One of our HLTAs, Helen, visited the local crossing, took 360 degree photos and made recordings of all the sounds encountered there. Samantha, our te technology teacher lead, transferred these onto a program on the VR computer that was connected to the rest of the VR equipment in the multi-sensory room. This produced a seamless 3D version of the crossing with relevant sounds and actions projected onto three walls of the room so that the students were surrounded by a real life situation, but in the safety of school. It was decided that 30 students aged from seven to 11 would benefit from this opportunity and consent forms plus useful information were sent home to the parents. All the parents consented to the trial. The panoramic view of the junction was projected onto the three walls. The colored spots on the floor in the room were beams of light projected from the ceiling and each had an image attached along with an accompanying sound where it was relevant. These were activated by the student with or without support passing a handheld controller across the appropriate colour to break the beam. Each student was offered an individual session of 10 to 15 minutes in length, only once a week, spanning a period of eight weeks. These sessions were split into three stages. During this time, each student was encouraged to act out crossing the road. They were required to listen out for the sights and sounds, they learned how to press the button to control and activate the traffic light system. And they learned to wait patiently as they looked and listened continuously. At the third stage, students were taken to the actual crossing to see whether the VR session had been successful or not in helping them to cross the road in a safe and timely manner. During one week, each student was taken to the crossing with staff 
and the success or failure of the program was observed. We had a 100% success rate. The VR room has been used to recreate many scenarios since. For instance, one of our boys was always late to school because his parents had to do a two mile detour to avoid any traffic lights on the way to school. If they tried to drive the route to school, he would have behavioral meltdown that was dangerous in the confined space of the car. Helen joined them on a couple of school runs to assess the problem. It took only two weeks of daily 20 minute use of the VR room where he completed the VR journey to school, operating the traffic lights for himself. He was given control of the situation that he had previously felt unable to control. And from that day onwards, they were able to use the short route to school and Sam entered school as a very happy and relaxed boy. Behaviour is a concern in most schools, but behaviour is a person's way of communicating that not all is well in their inner world. If we anaesthetise our students to control their behaviour, we are not helping them to address that behaviour. If we isolate them, or if we use physical restraint on them, we are just teaching them that this is all that we have to respond to their actions. We are showing them that there is nothing that we can do that they can copy to control their behavior before it gets out of control. But VR is a powerful tool, a powerful tool that students can use to control their behavior. The use of virtual reality to create controlled and safe environments that closely represent the real world has proved beneficial to all the students in my care. We all learn best by seeing them doing. Students with learning differences are now able to build new neural pathways and have their own internal secure library of how to cope with social situations that us ordinary people take for granted. You need staff with an interest in technology to create the 360 experiences, and you need the senior management team to prioritize this kind of learning and to have a supportive governing body. I was lucky on all counts. The VR room was also used as a space to distress and learn coping strategies, such as mindful breathing whilst watching a scene that comforts them. There are many such scenes that you may have encountered already on YouTube and currently you can subscribe to a channel there called Super Duper Fun Music that provides these backgrounds. It's also possible, as we found, for parents to share holiday photos or films with school that staff can turn into virtual backgrounds that then students can use in moments of stress. They can revisit a place that they've been with family that they really like going to. Some students in a special school have life limiting conditions and they don't have a promise of a future. They only have the now. It is our responsibility as educators to ensure that the now experiences we provide meet the needs of their inner world. My book, Virtual Reality, Augmented Reality and Artificial Intelligence in Special Education is published by Routledge and available to purchase in any good bookshop and is also available on Kindle format on Amazon. Thank you for listening.